so we'll continue the discussion of topological lattice model from gauging. And I want to clarify a few things that I, I talked about by the end of last lecture yesterday. Um, so I got a lot of questions about that. So I think I didn't make things very clear. So, so let me start with some clarification. First of all, uh, if you remember yesterday, what we did is to introduce the Tori code and then show how the Tori code can be obtained by gauging, doing something called gauging to the transverse field icing model, right? And in particular to, to the symmetric phase. And what we did is to take the exactly solvable limit of the symmetric phase and then gauge uh, the global Z2 symmetry such that we make it a local Z2 symmetry and turn it into a Tori code uh, by the end of last lecture. Okay, so this is the transverse field icing model. The transverse field icing model with a global Z2 symmetry, but then we want to make it into a gauge model with local symmetry that acts on a collection of what we call the matter field and the gauge field all together like that. And we modify the Hamiltonian such that each Hamiltonian term is now uh, explicitly invariant under all the local symmetry. Uh, transformations. And the, the, the way we did it is, of course, by dressing uh, these icing coupling terms by some, uh, uh, by, by this gauge field term. Okay. And then we said, okay, so these two terms we just inherited from the original transverse field icing model, but there will be too much degeneracy in the model because we didn't say anything about how the gauge field uh, would behave, uh, what, what kind of quantum dynamics they would have. So we want to add some extra term just for the gauge field because the gauge field is just wandering around, don't know what they should do, right? So we said, okay, we want to add the BP term. Okay. And the reason we want to add the BP term is because we're looking for terms for the gauge field itself. So it's a pure gauge term, but we still want to maintain a gauge symmetry. Right? So the gauge symmetry, the local symmetry is something that we want. It's the whole point of doing this process of gauging. So we want to add some term while maintaining the gauge symmetry. Okay. And you can see that if we want to maintain the gauge symmetry, uh, we cannot just add like one body tau, tau, tau x terms. What we have to do is to add a whole loop like that. Right? Remember that the BP terms, each of them is a loop of tau x. And that turns out to be the minimum term that we can add for the pure gauge field to introduce some dynamics for the gauge field, okay, to, 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 to uh, relieve the, the huge ground state degeneracy if we don't include these kind of local terms. Okay, so that's the first thing. So the, we don't just add BP term because we want the BP terms. It turns out they are the simplest term, the simplest term that we can add while preserving uh, the local gauge symmetry. And secondly, uh, another thing which I uh, uh, said in a very confusing way is I said that if we enforce the gauge symmetry, and by enforcing gauge symmetry, what I mean explicitly is that if we only look at a sector, sorry, if we only look at a sector where all the gauge symmetry terms are equal to one, so we force them to be one, okay? If we only look at a sector where all the gauge symmetry terms are equal to one, then we can have the equivalence between sigma z and uh, the four tau z. Okay, and that is something uh, we used to reduce this Hamiltonian explicitly to the Tori code Hamiltonian and show uh, their connection, right? But of course, enforcing all the gauge symmetry to be one is different from saying that the model has the symmetry. Usually if, we, if the system has symmetry, then there, the Hilbert space might transform non-trivially still under the, the symmetry. For example, if it's a Z2 symmetry, then the eigenvalue can be one or minus one. Right? That's totally possible. So here we are saying that if we forget about all the minus one sectors, if we only look at the plus one sector, then we, we have this equivalence. 
now we can do the reduction and the model becomes exactly equivalent to the toric code Hamiltonian. But of course we can, we, can, we can look at other sectors, we can just look sector by sector, we can look at other sectors where for example some of the uh, local symmetry transformation is equal to minus one, okay? Now other sectors where some of them are minus one, but that's just fine because um, that just means that in, in those sectors the sigma z would be equal to um, the product of tau z times minus one, right? So there's, a, there's still a one-to-one -one relation between what we consider as a gauge charge excitation and the original symmetry charge excitation, it's just the labeling uh, is opposite. Okay. So as long as you fix a particular sector where the UV takes either one or minus one value, then there is a correspondence between symmetry charge and gauge charge. Okay, um, so of course I did that in order to show you that this gauge model uh, of transverse field icing model is just toric code. That is the whole point, that we, we start from transverse field icing model, gauge it, and then we get toric code. Um, but actually, we, we, I, I don't really need to uh, enforce the gauge symmetry to be one or, or minus one. I don't need to enforce that it to be a particular value in order for this model to be in the same phase as toric code, right? So, of course, right now it doesn't, it doesn't look like the original toric code we were talking about because it involves sigma field, it involves tau field, so there are more degrees of freedom involved. So it looks kind of complicated. But it is totally still possible that this, this gauged Hamiltonian has the same kind of topological order as toric code, okay? That is, it shares all of the universal properties that we talked about yesterday, which are like full full ground state degeneracy on the torus, right? Uh, the, the gauge charge excitation, the gauge flux excitation, each of them being bosons, but they mutually have a minus one braiding statistics. Everything like that is actually the same between this gauge model and, and the simpler version of toric code that, that, I sh that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture yesterday. Okay. And we, we, can, we can actually work that out. So let's see. So this HG, let me just write everything out. So, okay, so we're looking, we were looking at the limit where the, the transverse field I think model is exactly solvable symmetric point, meaning that we set this J term, we set this, we set this J to be zero. Can you all hear me? This is better? Okay, <laughs> all right. Maybe I should. Uh, maybe this is, I was okay. Is, isn't this much louder? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'll just leave it like that. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. So I was saying that. Uh, uh, okay. So let, let's try to see how gauging the the symmetric limit of the transverse field icing model gives us something that's still in the same phase as toric code. Okay, so, so we're going to look at the limit where j is equal to zero. So j is equal to zero, and the gauge Hamiltonian looks something like minus i sigma z i minus sum over p bp. And now, instead of enforcing all the local symmetry terms to be one, we can just add them as another Hamiltonian term, okay? And we add them as, it, it, well, they're local terms, so we just think of them as something in the Hamiltonian that we can add. And it involves the sigma z and the four tau z. And that's it, okay? So the Hamiltonian contains three kinds of terms. One is a transverse field on the matter field. Uh, the, the, the plaquette term, and the vertex term, which is 
a little bit more complicated than the vertex term in the torical because it also involves uh, the matter field. Okay. okay. So I claim that the ground state property and the low energy excitation universal property are the same between this model and the torical model. And the easy way to see this is that if we are looking at low energy, we can first of all set this term to be one, right? We can first of all um, say, okay, we want to minimize energy for this sigma z term, meaning that we want to set sigma z equal to one everywhere, so we actually pin down the matter field. The matter field is just pointing in the, the positive z direction everywhere. And by doing that, we get rid of the, the sigma z in the middle for this term, and again, we get torque code, right? Oh, why do I choose this to be minus? Well, I choose to be minus because I just, I'm just saying that I want the ground state to have eigenvalue one. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Yes, so, so this particular choice of a minus sign in front of all this um, UV term now corresponds to saying that I want ground state to have UV equal to one. Of course, I can, I can choose different signs here. It's just saying that um, uh, at, at different lattice side, it might, I might have different uh, gauge constraint. Right, um, okay, but, but now there's a very, very important point that is, in the ground state of this term, where I said sigma z um, equal to one, I literally get rid of the sigma z in the middle of the vertex term, so that I only have the plaquette term and the vertex term, right? And, and that is literally the Tori code, and it's going to have um, uh, all, the sim, 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 all the same universal properties as the Tori code. But, on top of that, I can add some other small terms, like we talked about yesterday. We can add uh, tau x term with some small coefficient. We can add tau z term with some other small coefficient without affecting too much the universal property. Right? We argued yesterday why small perturbation doesn't break the four-fold ground state degeneracy of the Tauri code on the torus. And actually, small local perturbation doesn't change any of the universal properties we talk about, like uh, quasi-particle types, statistics, self, um, topological spin, braiding, whatever, okay. But on the other hand, you see that when we add terms like tau x, we're explicitly breaking the gauge symmetry. Okay, this, this used to be the, the local symmetry that we want to impose, right? We said that the whole process of gauging is to in, enforce, is to promote the global symmetry into a local symmetry. But now by doing this, by turning this into a local Hamiltonian, we, we see that we can actually, we are allowed to add terms that explicitly break the local symmetry constraint without affecting the physics too much. Okay, so this is, um, this is something that's, uh, that's, that's more of a condensed matter point, point of view about, about gauge theory. That is, gauge symmetry is a, is a way to motivate everything that we do here. Now we, we start from things with a global symmetry, promote it to a local symmetry, and we write it down such that everything's gauge invariant. But after that's done, it's not that important. Okay, especially for the case where we get a, a gapped Hamiltonian. Once we get a gapped Hamiltonian, we actually don't care so much about gauge symmetry. And gauge symmetry is in some sense an emerged symmetry. And what's actually emerging is the topological order that's emerging. Okay, it's the ground state degeneracy, it's the fractional excitation, it's the statistics that's emerging out of this whole process. So we do take the, the gauge symmetry seriously when we try to say how we want to gauge a model. We started from a model and we want to gauge it, and in, during this step, we want to make sure that we, we enforce the gauge symmetry because otherwise we don't have any clue how to, how to do the gauging procedure. 
But once we did the gauging procedure and we get a gauge model, we actually can relax the constraint a little bit. But not by too much. We cannot put this term to be too big. If it's too big, then something bad can happen. But as long as this is a very small perturbation, all the physics survive in the gauge model. Okay. Is that clear? Yes. Topological what, sorry? Uh, yes, exactly. I'm saying but, that. But, but, but somehow it, it is a Yes. Uh, uh, yes, yes, exactly. So, so. Yes. Right, right, right. So that's, that's a good question. So the question is about um, now the topological order is not protected by the gauge symmetry, whether they're still related in a certain way. Right, yes, exactly. So, um, so I would say that topological order is not protected in the way that we don't need to enforce explicitly operators like that. We, we can break operators like that, but there's a sense of renormalized gauge symmetry emerging. Okay, so, so as long as we stay in the same phase, you can imagine that it's not exactly this operator that's preserved, but there's some dress version, some expanded version, which would look much more ugly than this one. It may become bigger, it may even have a tail, decaying tail, but there's some version of emergent um, symmetry transformation in the model. And that, that literally is, uh, if you see that this is, this is related to the, to the hopping, to the string operator uh, of a flux, right? The flux, the string operator for the flux is the tau z, tau z, tau z, tau z. So, so this gauge symmetry is something like bringing, a, creating a pair of flux and bringing them around. And that al always exists whenever we're in the topological phase. You can say that maybe on a larger scale, you can always do this process of creating a pair of flux and annihilating them uh, around a circle. And if we're in a ground state, that's always an invariant operation. As long as we don't have excitation in the system, in the ground state, then we can always create a pair of flux and bring them around and finally annihilate them. And that will be the local symmetry transformation in this case. So, so, so as long as, or in an, another way of saying it, it says as long as we have the same topological order, we always have uh, this kind of symmetry. But, but that symmetry would, would not look exactly like this. Okay, it will look different. Uh, in principle, yes, yes. Uh, if, if, if you give me an ugly Hamiltonian like this, I wouldn't know how to write down exactly the operator because the operator would look bigger and it will probably not even be finite, exactly finite size. It will, de it will decay. Yeah, so. It's local in some sense because it will be an operator that has a profile that looks like this with a tail decaying, but but then I don't know how to write it in an explicit way. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, exactly. So so now we we include the we still keep the matter field here and uh, uh, and we involve the matter field in the UV. So. Um, the high energy excited states will, will be different. Um, yeah, but we, we, now we, we care about ground state and we care about low energy excitations and that will be the same. And we care about fractional excitations on top of the low energy excitations uh, uh, on the ground state. So those will be the same. And, and actually explicitly we can see that the string operator almost still look exactly the same. with some caveat 
Um, so the string operator say for a flux, if we want to create a flux, a pair of flux along this line, all we do is still to apply tau z, tau z, and tau z along the whole way. Right. Um, okay. Now if we want to generate, if we want to, if we want to hop the charges, okay. Let's say we want to hop the charge along a line from this point to this point. So originally in the transverse field icing model, the way to create a charge is to do something that anti-commutes with the symmetry. We want to do a sigma x that anti-commutes with the symmetry and locally generate a charge. So, so we do sigma x here. But of course, we cannot just do one sigma x because we want to preserve the global symmetry. So we need, we need to hop the charge onto the next side. We need to do another sigma x here, right? Um, but now we gauge it. After we gauge it, we know that this is not gauging variant. What we need to do is to add a tau x in between. Okay, so this becomes a single charge hopping step. And we can keep doing it. So we do sigma x, tau x, sigma x, and then we do sigma x, tau x, sigma x again. But the two sigma x cancel each other like this. Right? So we just have a string of tau x in between two sigma x. And we can keep doing that so that we, we actually stretch a line of tau x until we have moved the, the, the sigma x to the other end. Okay. So this is the string operator for the charge hopping in this model. And you can see that even though at the end it's stressed by the matter field, in between it's exactly the same as the previous string operator we have for the pure gauge theory. And because of that, if you calculate like self-statistics by doing the figure of eight, or if you calculate the mutual statistics be between this string operator and that string operator by, by doing some commutation relation, it's going to be exactly the same. So of course, the, the, the dressing at the two ends, it doesn't really matter. OK. OK, so let's try to summarize a little bit before we move on, just to see uh, what we learn from this case. Okay. We take the transverse field Ising model, put in the gauge field, such that we can make it uh, locally symmetric. And the, the first thing I want to point out here is that look at the way we, we changed the, the term that was in the original Hamiltonian. Okay. So, so this transverse field, it doesn't change at all. Uh, this icing coupling term, we dress it with some uh, gauge field in the x basis. But that is all we're going to do. If we have other terms like xx coupling at a longer distance, we talked about yesterday, all we do is to put in more tau x along the way, connecting the two, right? So if we only look at Hamiltonian terms involving the matter field, they correspond to the same dynamics because, because the, the operator algebra is still the same. Okay, so the gauge field, we, we put them in there, but they just go along for the ride. Right. They just uh, connect the, the sigma x operator whenever they need to, and they only come in the tau x form. They never come in the tau z form. The tau z form is only in the, uh, sorry, the, the tau z form comes in uh, these kind of terms. Right. So if we only look at the dynamical terms for the matter field, is exactly the same um, uh, as the original model, which means that whatever the matter field was originally doing, it is still doing the same thing after we couple it to the gauge field. Okay, if it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, if it's symmetry breaking, it's symmetry breaking. If it's symmetric, it's symmetric. If it's gapless, it will be still gapless. 
if it's some non-trivial uh, insulator or superconductor, it's still the non-trivial insulator or superconductor. So dynamics for matter field is the same. At least in the, in the ground state and the low energy sector where, where this term is said to be one. So at least at low energy, when we put, don't put in extra flux, when, 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 the, when the background flux pattern is just trivial, and we don't have flux anywhere, the matter field is just doing whatever it used to be doing, okay? Of course, the, the non-trivial thing is how the, the gauge field get involved, right? Now, now there's a gauge field, and the gauge field is doing something, and I want to understand what the gauge field is doing. Um, so first of all, as we saw yesterday, uh, the gauge charge, the gauge charge is just something that we inherit from the ungauged model. The gauge charge is simply the symmetry charge before gauging. So gauge charge comes from symmetry charge. And this immediately tells us a lot. For example, originally we have a Z2 symmetry, so we know that the Z2 charge is either zero or one. Okay? And if we have two charge, that's equivalent to zero, which means that the gauge charge in the gauge model, if you fuse two of them, that goes into the identity channel. Okay? So if we have two of the gauge charge, and if we fuse them, that goes back to uh, just what I write as one, meaning that uh, the, the, the trivial fractional excitation channel. Okay. So the fusion channel of the gate charges come from the symmetry charge. And secondly, the statistics of the gate charge, the, the topological spin of the gate charge, is also inherited from the symmetry charge. And in this case, we know we started from a spin model, so the local gate charge excitations are all bosonic. So these are bosonic uh, excitations. Of course, there can be other possibilities. We can have model where we have a fermion degrees of freedom, and the fermion degrees of freedom might have a, a, a Z2 global symmetry. So fermion model always have a Z2 global symmetry, which is the fermion parity symmetry, and we can gauge that uh, global Z2 symmetry. In that case, the gauge charge will be a fermion, yes. Uh, right, good question. So uh, in, in QED, which I'm actually going to talk about later, so say what well, the connection is to things I'm talking about here, but just to answer your question, in QED we get photon because that's a continuous gauge field. And here this is a discrete uh, Z2 gauge field, so actually the photon is gapped out, so we don't have a, a gapless sector. And you can see that all the excitations are gapped. Um, uh, I think we were writing something here yesterday, I was saying that um, the E excitation, uh, each of them can cost energy two, and the M excitation also can cost energy two, so all the excitations are gapped. Okay. Of course, also in this case, the matter field is gapped. If the matter field is, is gapless, then it will be gapless. Um, okay, and the uh, third thing is that um, there's going to be an aharonov bohm effect. aharonov bohm phase factor um, between the gauge charge and the gauge flux. And, uh, and yesterday we saw that come from the braiding statistic between E and M, which is the commutation relation of the string operator of tau x and tau z. And that 
is set just by the symmetry because this is a Z2 symmetry. So the gauge charge going around the gauge flux can only generate a phase factor of minus one. If we do have U1 symmetry, uh, if we have real electromagnetism where electrons go around a, a, a flux loop, uh, go, go around some, some flux, that phase factor can be anything, right? Between anything of zero and two pi. Uh, so this factor is determined just by symmetry group. The original global symmetry group. So fusion rule comes from symmetry, and the self statistics comes from uh, the original model, from statistics of symmetry charge. So you can see that even even without doing this exercise of taking the model and actually change the Hamiltonian and then solve for the, the gauge Hamiltonian and, 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 uh, and solve for the ground state degeneracy, excitation, breeding statistics, we can already tell a lot about the gauge theory, right? We know that the, the gauge charge has two fields like this. We know the gauge charge has to be bosonic. We know the gauge charge and gauge flux has to have Braiding statistics like that. Okay, so that is all just set by symmetry alone. So in a lot of cases, it's actually quite hard to do this exercise. For example, when j is not equal to zero, then the model is not exactly solvable. And you can do this exercise and, and, and writing down this gauge Hamiltonian, but it will not be very straightforward to analyze the Hamiltonian. Okay, or in some more complicated models, it might not be very straightforward to analyze the gauge Hamiltonian. But even without doing that, we know we should get at least one, two, three, okay? This is just guaranteed uh, when we do this procedure of gauging. And the final fourth one is the only tricky place uh, that, we, that we do need to analyze the gauge Hamiltonian in order to figure out, which is what the flux is doing. So the flux excitation, unlike the gauge, uh, unlike the charge excitation, is something that didn't really exist uh, in the original, um, in, in the original uh, 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 global symmetry model, in the transverse field model. Okay, it is something that we add into the model by hand, and um, uh, of course we were saying that if there's no flux excitation, the matter field is doing whatever it does. But if there's a non-trivial flux pattern, for example, in, through each of the plaquette, we can put a pi flux. And we can set up the, the flux configuration such that it is non-trivial, then that might change the dynamics of the matter field. Just imagine that this, this tau x, if it takes on non-zero value, it takes on non-trivial value, then it might change the dynamics of the matter field. And, uh, and exactly because the gauge field, the gauge flux, is something that's involved with the dynamics of the matter field, so the gauge flux somehow knows about the dynamics of the gauge field. Okay. Unlike, the charge, unlike the charge excitation, the charge excitation doesn't really know the dynamics of the, uh, the, the matter field. But the gauge flux, it does, and it responds to that. Okay. And it responds to that in a way by changing its own statistics. So I, of course, in this case, we see that it's, it's the simplest case. It's the simplest model that we can think about. So the gauge flux is doing something very, very trivial. It's a bosonic quasi-particle, and bosonic is, uh, is the most trivial thing you can think about. Right? But once we go to some slightly more non-trivial state, which maybe I have time to talk about today, then the flux excitation is actually going to respond to that by becoming a, a, a non-bosonic excitation. For example, if the state is not a, uh, a simple 
uh, transverse field icing model is not the symmetric phase of the transverse field icing model if it becomes something called the symmetry protected topological phase still with Z2 global symmetry, then one, two, three still holds, okay? And especially two and three still holds. But four is going to change where the gauge flux is going to respond to the symmetry protected order by turning into a semionic excitation. It's going to change itself statistics. Okay, that's what gauge flux is too. Uh, gauge flux, they, uh, they encode the non-trivial order of the original system in terms of its own statistics. Okay. And that's why gauging becomes a, a useful thing to do because if we start from some model which we don't know really what is going on, and then you can try to detect for the order by coupling to the gauge field and, um, and then extract what, what, and, and see what the flux term is doing, uh, the flux excitation is doing. I'm not saying that's an easy thing to do, but <laughs> of course, ideally uh, or uh, logically, that is a possible path to investigate the original uh, model. Okay? All right. <coughs> Sorry. Good. So, um, so this is just trying to summarize what we learned yesterday, and now we're ready to move on. Um, we're not moving on very far away, we're just moving on to the limit where J is much, much larger than one. Okay. So yesterday we were lo only looking at the limit where uh, J is much, much smaller than one, and we we'll actually literally set J equal to zero. And now we're going to look at the case where J is much, much larger than one, so we're going to ignore the second term. We're going to ignore the, the transverse field icing term. Uh, sorry, the transverse field term in the model, and we all know what happens to the transverse field icing model. The model goes into a symmetry breaking phase, and we're going to see what happens to the gauge theory. Okay, so the Hamiltonian for the transverse field icing model is simply sigma x, sigma x, which is drop the sigma z term. And the gauge Hamiltonian, well, we know how to write it down. We just uh, take this Hamiltonian and then uh, drop this term. And, and then putting the gauge symmetry as another local term into the Hamiltonian. So we have sigma x i tau x i j sigma x j uh, minus the BP terms and minus uh, the UV terms. Sigma z tau z tau z tau z tau z sum over vertex. Okay, so we get another Hamiltonian, and we get another Hamiltonian where all the terms commute with each other. Right, so it's still nice. Okay. So, um, so, so, so this is a exactly solve a model, so in principle, we should be able to figure out what is going on in this gauge model. So what I'm going to claim, and I'm going to show you, is that this model doesn't have topological order. Yes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're saying that why I'm not dropping all the other terms for the gauge field as well. Okay, sorry. Um, and a better way to say this is that maybe I add a, a B coefficient here, and now I'm sending B to zero. 
Okay, I'm just saying that I want to be in the symmetry breaking phase of transverse field icing model, then I couple to the gauge field. I do want some non-trivial gauge field involved and then couple it. Okay, so, so um, I'm dropping this term, but I'm, I still do want to keep the, the gauge field term. So I'm actually increasing the, ter the coefficient in front of the, the gauge field while I do that. So I, I should have put a J here and a B here, and a J here and a B here, and now I'm in, uh, now what I'm doing is to set B to zero. So, so I didn't um, worry too much about these coefficients because mostly I'm talking about ground states. Um, and, and, and these J and B, they're going to give some energy scale to the excitations, but as long as that's finite, uh, I didn't care too much. Yes. So, uh, yes, yes. So, so, uh, so, so, okay. So, we literally just take the transverse field icing model where we gauge everything, and then we say, okay, we were origin originally in the symmetry breaking phase, so so we can ignore this term, but. All the other terms are just here. They, they just, I just copied from here. I did nothing. I just copied from, from this, this side to the other side. Oh, the last term, yeah. Yeah, the, you, you, the last term, you can always do that. You can always just put it in uh, as an extra local Hamiltonian term. Uh, or a better way to put it is that y you can deal with it in two ways. Either you set them all to zero, you say that, okay, I lo only look at the gauge invariant sector. And the other way is to include them into the dynamics such that it, they, they don't become hard constrained. They're, they're soft constrained that can be violated, but the ground state doesn't violate them. Yeah. So the ground state properties are all the same. Yeah, so it's, once I involve them in the Hamiltonian, it's not a constraint anymore. The Hilbert space does contain terms that violate this, this, this AV term, but at low energy, I don't violate them. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, so, so the, the goal is to show that this is not topological. Not topological in the sense that um, there's no ground state degeneracy on the torus. There are no non-trivial fractional excitations, no braiding statistics. Excitations are just local excitations and they move around, but they don't braid with each other and we call it not topological. Okay, so this is actually uh, possible to do and even possible to do uh, as I stand here in class. Um, first of all, you notice that this is uh, exactly a solvable model because all the terms still explicitly commute with each other. You can, can check that. Um, that's how we, we came up with the, the Hamiltonian in the first place, right? Uh, they commute with each other. So in principle, we sh with some effort, we should be able to uh, solve for the ground state and low energy excitations at least, okay? And um, uh, okay, so the way you can see that is first by noticing that uh, the BP term is actually right now redundant. Okay, so the BP term involves tau x, tau x, tau x, and tau x, right, for all of them. But it's simply a composition of the first term, which is the, the icing coupling term, around these four edges. Because the first term is like sigma x, tau x, sigma x. And if I do that around the four edges of a single plaquette, I cancel the sigma x part and get a BP term. Which is saying that 
if I do get a, a ground state wave function which has eigenvalue one for all the sigma x tau x sigma x term, then I automatically satisfy, uh, I automatically have eigenvalue one for the BP term, right? So, so BP term is kind of redundant. We can, we need to only look at the first term and forget about the BP term in this case. Okay, just forget about it. Of course, this is only true if we're looking at the ground state where everything is eigenvalue one for the first kind of term. Okay, so now we have, mm, now we have a square lattice with matter field at the vertices and gauge field on the links. And they're coupled. Still a very, not very simple Hamiltonian because everything's coupled and everything will be entangled. But this is actually a Hamiltonian that's very popular in quantum information. In quantum information, people study this Hamiltonian a lot and this is actually called a cluster state Hamiltonian. Okay, so the kind of term that we have in the Hamiltonian is uh, sigma x tau x sigma x and then uh, sigma z tau z tau z tau z tau z. Right, we, can, we have two different kinds of terms. So we can do the same exercise as we did yesterday. Okay, we can count what is the total Hilbert space dimension for the system, and then we can count how many poly operators, how many um, poly operators do we have in the community Hamiltonian, which each one, where each of them cut the Hilbert space in half, right? And then finally, we need to look for possible global constraints between all these. Um, poly operators, because yesterday we see that and that's how it gave rise to the four-four degeneracy in the Tauric code. Right? There was some global constraint between all the AV and BP term in the Tauric code. That's why we have a four-four degeneracy for the Tauric code. Okay, so we can do that here. Uh, we see that uh, well. We have some uh, matter field. We have some gauge field, and you can see that. These kind of term, they're centered around the gauge field. Right? We have one term per gauge field. They just live on the links and they're centered uh, at the, the gauge field. So one term per gauge field. And this type of term is centered around the matter field and one term per matter field. Okay. So we literally have the same number of Hamiltonian terms and the same number of uh, degrees of freedom. So the total Hilbert space dimension, if we keep dividing it by two per each of the Hamiltonian term, we get just down to one. And the only tricky part that we need to worry about is whether there's going to be uh, global constraints among all these kind of terms. Right? If there are no global constraint, then we have a unique ground state. If we do have global constraint, we might have more than one uh, ground state. So if you stare at it, <laughs> if you stare at it for a long enough time, I hope that you can convince yourself that there are no uh, global constraints among all these kind of Hamiltonian terms. Remember that uh, yesterday when, uh, if you remember, uh, the AV term, there, there are also these kind of terms but without the sigma z in the middle, right? And the AV term, if we multiply everything together, it goes into identity. Right. But here, because there's a sigma z term in the middle, so if we multiply all these kind of terms together over the whole lattice, we get a tensor product of all the sigma z, which is not identity. So this is, this is uh, you, you can do the same thing as yesterday, but that doesn't give you a global constraint uh, on, the, on the local terms. Uh, so this is just tr me trying to argue my way around, uh, just trying to say that 
this model, if you do the exercise and literally solve it for the ground state, you're going to see that the ground state is not going to be degenerate no matter what kind of manifold you put it on. It's unique ground state, no fractional excitation, no statistics. It's actually just a, a, a totally trivial, topologically trivial model. The wave function is going to be a little bit complicated because everything's interacting, so the wave function is still entangled, but it's something that we call short range entangled because we, we can build up the ground state by starting from a product state and doing some local unitary transformation. Okay, so it's very, very different from the Tori cold Hamiltonian, which we get by gauging the symmetric limit uh, of the transverse field icing model, which does have ground state degeneracy, does have uh, fractional excitations, does have statistics, and the ground state wave function, you cannot just get it by studying from product state and doing simple local unitaries. Okay. Okay, so what is the, the punchline here? What am I doing? I take the symmetry breaking phase, couple it to the gauge field. And the coupling to the gauge field procedure, of course, is, it's generic. It's something that we can do for whatever model that has global symmetry without any relevance to what the phase is uh, for the original global symmetric model. And then I see that the gauge model is not topological, <laughs> okay? Something trivial. How does that make sense? And that makes sense if you have heard of the term uh, Higgs. Okay. I assume everyone has heard of, about Higgs, the Higgs particle, the Higgs mechanism, um, but probably in a very different context. Right? You've heard about Higgs, about how the Higgs particle was discovered uh, at LHC and uh, how it gives mass to all the fundamental particles. Um, and maybe you have also heard about it in terms of superconductors. Superconductor also undergoes so-called, uh, it also is, is an example of a Higgs mechanism. And it's a Higgs mechanism uh, with respect to uh, the electromagnetic field. Okay. So there, there are uh, two places where Higgs is usually mentioned. In the standard model, standard model. In a standard model, and the Higgs mechanism involves uh, the, the electroweak interaction. Okay, so in the standard model, and there's a SU2 gauge group and the U1 gauge group. And, and these are the gauge group that are responsible for the weak interaction and the electromagnetic interaction. And it turns out that this gauge group is breaking down to just U1. It's a, it started from a much larger big, uh, a gauge group and gets reduced to U1. And this U1 turns out to be the, uh, the electromagnetic gauge field giving rise to photon electromagnetism and everything. On the other hand, we have superconductor. Where originally, a superconductor, we know how to get a superconductor. We start from metal which has U1 symmetry, which can couple to external electromagnetic field. But once it becomes superconducting, the gauge group becomes Z2. Okay, so we say that um, ele uh, the, the electromagnetic field in a superconductor is Higgs. The gauge group started from U1 gets reduced to Z2. So Higgs, if you want to have a, a very simple, very naive way of understanding what is Higgs, it's a reduction of gauge group. Okay. So reducing gauge group from a bigger group to a smaller group. Uh, this, is, this is my naive uh, interpretation. Of course, there's much more to Higgs uh, than this, but this is like a, the, the, the minimum uh, version of understanding what's going, what, what is called Higgs. And the reason why we can reduce gauge group is because there's some symmetry breaking going on. 
right? In superconductor, we know that it's the, the Cooper condensation, right? The, the electrons, they form Cooper pairs, and the Cooper pairs condense so that we don't have charge conservation anymore. We only have conservation up to two. Right? We only have, uh, we, only, we, 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 we can only talk about the even and oddness of uh, quasi-particles in a superconductor so that the global symmetry is reduced from U1 to Z2, and that happens spontaneously. Okay. So, so superconductor is basically undergoing a spontaneous symmetry breaking from U1 to Z2, and the gauge field get Higgs along the way. In the standard model, it's the same. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, uh, some symmetry breaking, spontaneous symmetry breaking happens and reduce the gauge group from this big one uh, to the smaller one. And that's also exactly what's happening in our toy model of transverse field icing model coupled to a Z2 gauge field. Of course, the original gauge field we started with is Z2. It's already the, the, the smallest group you can think about. Okay. Unless we have spontaneous symmetry breaking, it breaks into nothing. It doesn't get reduced to a smaller group. The Z2 group just becomes not a group, just becomes nothing. The, the, so so the, originally we started from the toric, uh, 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 once we gauge it, on the symmetric side, we have the toric code, which is the deconfined Z2 gauge theory. But if the matter field undergoes spontaneous symmetry breaking from Z2 symmetry to, to no symmetry, then the gauge group in the gauge theory also reduced to nothing, which is why the, the, the gauge theory has no topological order at all. Okay. The gauge group is now nothing. Okay. Yes? Sorry? The, the word limit? Yeah, the trivial group, yes, yes. Exactly, a group with one element. Uh, right, so, so, so given that, given that we know uh, what happens um, when things get Higgs, it shouldn't be a surprise that when we do this exercise and we take the, uh, the symmetry breaking limit, couple it to gauge field, and analyze what happens with the gauge Hamiltonian, we found that it's not topological. Okay, this is what we should find. Otherwise, we'll be in trouble. Um, and this, this exercise of talking about cluster state, counting the, the number of Hamiltonian terms, this is just to confirm what we should be able to find. Okay. So lesson learned is that if we start from the symmetric phase of the model, we get some truly topological order with ground state degeneracy quasi-particle. If we start from the symmetry breaking phase, we get a non-topological model. Of course, if we start from a bigger symmetry, if we get, from, say, for example, if we started from uh, Z4 symmetry, okay, then it is possible to partially hex the gauge field. We can, we can partially, spontaneously break maybe a Z2 subgroup of the total group such that we retain uh, some gauge structure in the, in the gauge theory, and we can still have a Z2 topological order in the end. But if we are in the symmetric phase, we should get a Z4 topological order. Okay, uh, maybe this is a good time for a break. And when we come back, I'll talk about um, how this, how this this notion of gauging, how, how the, the gauging I've been showing you is related to, to the kind of gauge theory, gauge field you have all heard about, especially um, everyone, when we take uh, electromagnetism, even classical electromagnetism, Maxwell's equation, we have heard about gauge field. I'm going to talk about how they're related, how that version of gauge field can be reduced uh, to whatever I'm showing here. Okay, I'll see you in 10 minutes.
So uh, this is regarding posters. You have time until noon um, to submit uh, your abstract if you have not done so. By the way, many people have already submitted during the application uh, procedure. And you don't need to send again because the secretary is receiving multiple copies of the, of the same thing. So, so if you have done it already, don't fret. And uh, by the end of today, I'll tell you, um, so until noon to submit the abstract of the poster. This afternoon, I will tell you which posters are accepted, which not. We'll tell you by, by yes. Yeah, this was the third point uh, that I was going to, so yes, the next slide says, uh, answers that. So, um, okay, so uh, this afternoon I will tell you um, by email who has been accepted and who is not. Tomorrow I will give you instruction on how to print your poster in case you have to print a poster. Now, yes. Oh, I cannot hear that. What did you say? You can send an email to the secretary. The address is, in case you have not seen the web page of the school at all in the last two weeks, is SMR 35 at ictp.it. Okay. Tomorrow, I will give you instruction on how to print a poster, in case you need to print. By the way, how many of you already have it printed? Okay. Those of you who have printed, please do not ask to reprint it because you found that uh, there was a minus sign that should have been a plus or, or things like that, because it costs us 10 euros per poster, okay? So we're going to pay for those who have not printed it, but if everybody has to reprint it, I will ask, you know, <laughs> I will ask a contribution to the budget. So it costs us something to, to print a poster, right? So tomorrow I'll give you more instruction about this. And uh, so uh, you're, you're finishing at 11, and then there will not be coffee break because the lunch break is just extended until uh, 2.30. And then at 2.30 we have another lecture, and then there is the colloquium uh, by uh, um, Professor Dalibar, who's gonna be here, and a lot of more people will join us. That's all, I, I'm not gonna take more of your time, thanks. Okay, now it's up. So now I'm going to tell you how the gauge field I'm, I'm talking about here is actually related to the things you probably have heard about, uh, about gauge theory starting from very early years in terms of electromagnetism, Maxwell's equation, how those two are actually the same thing. It might not look like that at all <laughs> when I wrote things down over there. Um, Maxwell's equation. So let me re remind myself what Maxwell's equation looks like. Of course, Maxwell's equation is classical physics. Okay. When, when Maxwell wrote down his equations, it's not quantum mechanical yet. It's a classical theory of how electricity and magnetism turn into each other, and electric field turn into magnetic field, magnetic field turn into electric field, and how the charge uh, and current respond to that. And uh, it's a, a set of four equations, for of B is equal to zero, sorry, uh, divergence of B equal to zero, uh, curl of E is equal to minus partial B partial T, and then uh, the divergence of E is not necessarily zero. It's related to charge density. 
So the, in the integrated form of uh, Maxwell's equation, we know that this uh, can be interpreted as you integrate the, the electric flux through a surface, and that gives you how much charge is enclosed in that surface. Okay. So, so of course, I'm writing down the uh, differential form of Maxwell's equation, but you can turn everything into an integrated form. And finally, we have uh, the curl of B is, it has two contributions. One is the real current, and the other is the time derivative of electric field. OK, so, so this is uh, Maxwell's equation in terms of E field and B field. And e field and B field, there, there's something measurable. They're real. Um, but what, what people notice is that um, we can introduce some fictitious field, the A field and the phi field, the vector potential, and the electrostatic potential to simplify the equations. Right? And in particular, if we set the magnetic field to be the curl of A, then we automatically satisfy this equation because the divergence of a curl is zero. Okay. So, um, so if we choose B to be equal to curl of A, uh, we don't need to solve the, the first equation at all. And second thing is that we can choose the E field to be minus gradient phi minus partial A partial T. And if we choose the E field to be such a combination between these fictitious fields, now we don't, need to uh, we don't need to solve the second equation. The second equation is automatically satisfied. Okay, so this sim seems to be simplifying things because we introduce some A field and phi field, and of course we can plug them in into the following two equations to get some non-trivial relation between A and phi, and also in their relation between the, the charge density and current density. Now we can try to solve for the uh, whole dynamics of the system. Right? If we have only vacuum, we will find some plane waves or some other form of waves uh, up to some boundary condition. I'm sure everyone did that exercise a long time ago, <laughs> maybe. Um, but the thing is, this, when, when you use the A field and the phi field to try to solve for the Maxwell's equation, you get some redundancy. Okay? And in particular, if A field transform as A plus gradient F, where F is any function of space time. And let me just write space. Let's restrict the space. Phi is, if F is any function of space, and then phi goes to phi minus partial F. I guess I need to put in the time coordinate anyway. So the, part, uh, the, the time derivative of f, and f is again a function of space time, those two transformations, those transformations of a and phi for any kind of f, give you the same e and b. Okay, you can plug in this transformation and see that it doesn't affect e and b at all. Okay, so, so in classical, electromagnetism, um, the A field and phi field are considered as something that's, that's fictitious, that's something that we just introduce uh, for the purpose of uh, mathematical convenience. Um, but once we solve the equation in terms of A and phi, uh, and we try to get back to E and B, we need to remember that not all different solutions of A and phi are actually physically different, because they might give rise to the same E and B, and in particular, any the two different solutions related in this way, they're actually physically the same. And so, 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 so gauge symmetry in that case just represents a redundancy in our attempt to change variable in the Maxwell's equation. It's some, something that's fake. That's something that we should get rid of. And, but, but it simplifies the equation, so we do it anyway, but we need to get rid of it in the end. And now, um, and people go to 
quantum electromagnetism called QED, quantum electrodynamics. And a, a big a realization when we go quantum is that the A and phi field are not fake. They are real. Okay. There's something that actually exists, and there's something that's actually fundamental. And, um, and the B and E field, on the other hand, becomes something that can be derived uh, from the A and phi field. And the reason people think that way is exactly because of uh, the aharonov bohm effect that we talked about yesterday. Okay. can put a, a, a current carrying solenoid where there's a current going through generating some magnetic field, but the magnetic field is confined within the very, very thin solenoid. Okay. Uh, you have a configuration like that, uh, the magnetic field, uh, leaking of magnetic field out of the solenoid is very, very small. However, if you put some electrons, and electrons might go along some path around the solenoid, but at a distance that's very large uh, away from the hole, such that the magnetic field in the region outside is literally just zero. But the electrons going around the solenoid still feels the existence of the electromagnetic field by changing the phase factor of its wave function. And know what we know what happens when the wave function changes phase factor, the interference pattern that we get uh, at the final screen will shift its location. Okay. So the, the experiment is done like, uh, originally you don't put any current in the solenoid so there's no flux through the hole and you get some interference pattern. And then you turn on the current and uh, increase the, the flux through the hole and you see that the, the pattern will shift. That's because along the same trajectory, the electron will accumulate different phase shift along the trajectory such that uh, the interference maximum is moved from here to here and the minimum is moved from here to here. Okay. This is just saying that the A field and phi field, they are actually real things in uh, quantum mechanics. So in, in the quantum mechanical formulation of how uh, electrons or how fundamental particles coupled to uh, electromagnetic field, we cannot use E and B to write the equation, right? We actually need to uh, involve A and phi into the Hamiltonian, the Lagrangian, uh, or whatever you want to write in order to describe the system. All right, so, uh, so, so, so but, but the gauge symmetry is still here. The gauge symmetry, for example, where A goes to A plus gradient F, that's still there. And that is still a redundant symmetry. So it's a, it's a quite tricky situation in quantum mechanics that we want to think of A and uh, phi as real, but somehow they have this weird redundancy associated with them. It's, it's, just, it's just how nature is. That's um, it's how the whole standard model is formulated, that we have some field, but they have some redundancy. But because of that, there are a lot of amazing things happening. Right? Um, so, so we learn to get used to that <laughs> and uh, live with that. And uh, dual theory, while remembering that there's this kind of uh, redundancy involved uh, in the theory. Okay. So, so you might already see that there is some similarity between this transformation and the, the transformation I'm talking about over there, even though they, they still look very different right now. So here, the gradient of F is what we call the local gauge transformation, or the, just the gauge transformation, and F can be anything. F can be any function, and in particular, it can be a delta function, uh, localized in space. If F is localized in space, then only and the A field that's right next to it gets transformed. Everywhere else, it stays the same. 
So there can be symmetry transformation that's localized around a particular point in space. And that's what's happening here. Here we have the UV operator, which is acting around a particular point uh, in space. Um, okay. And on the other hand, um, in, a, uh, in the quantum theory of electrodynamics, we not only have the gauge field transform um, like that, at the same time we have the matter field, which is, well, the electrons moving in space. Suppose that this is the electron field, or you can think of it as the electron wave function, you can think of it as the, uh, the creation operator of the, of the electron at every spatial location. That will transform under the same local symmetry transformation. And well, as you can imagine, the way that the, the matter field will transform is by accumulating certain phase factor. Right? And that phase factor is exactly this F. Probably want a minus sign here. So we have the gauge field transforming, we have the matter field transforming, and then we put them together and they couple in a certain way. Okay. So, so how is that related to the UV over there? Uh, let me try to walk my way back. Mm. So the first thing we want to do is to put things on a lattice, right? Because um, the torque code, we did it on the lattice. So let's try to put the electromagnetism also on a lattice. Ah, I shouldn't have erased this. So we have, um, let's say again, a square lattice where the matter field is at the lattice point where the matter field here are the electron matter field and, um, and, and the, the creation and annihilation operator is given by C dagger and C. Okay, so, and almost the same thing as phi over there, just uh, using the more common lattice notation for electron creation and annihilation. So the electrons, if they hop on this two-dimensional lattice, they if, if it's an insulator or, or metal, if it's not superconducting, then it has a, uh, a U1 global symmetry. Okay. So if we do the transformation of E to the I alpha C dagger, then C goes to E to the minus I alpha C, and we, we use a constant alpha everywhere. This is a global symmetry for electron hopping in two dimension, right? Because all the Hamiltonian terms we are going to have is C dagger C plus C C dagger, something like that. So if we have C and C dagger transform in the opposite way with certain phase factor, the whole Hamiltonian is invariant. And this is the global U1 symmetry. Okay, but now we're not satisfied with just being globally symmetric. What we want is local symmetry. We want to promote this coefficient alpha to be a local thing, meaning that we want alpha to have spatial dependence. So we want local symmetry such that C dagger goes to e to the i f x C dagger and C goes to e to the i minus i f x C dagger. And in particular, I can choose this f function to be a delta function 
at a particular lattice site, so I'm doing transformation only at that lattice site. So this is how the, the matter field transforms. But, well, if we want to make the symmetry local, we need to pay the price of introducing gauge field. Well, the gauge field, as you can imagine, uh, they now live on the edges. Right? They live on the links of the two-dimensional lattice, where on each link we have a gauge field of A. And now here's where the the quantum mechanics of the gauge field comes in. In quantum mechanics, this A field is not just a number field. It's not like for each spatial location I have a vector or a number or a set of numbers. This A field is an operator and it can have non-trivial commutation relation with another operator, which is the E field. So in Quantum electromagnetism, E and A become a pair of conjugate variables. Let me write conjugate fields. Conjugate electromagnetic field. So of course, E and A are both vectors. So let's label uh, their directions by A and B and their location, spatial location as X and X prime. And the commutation relation is given by I delta AB delta X, X prime. So on the lattice, we'll have a quantum degree of freedom on each link whose conjugate variable are given by E and A. And on the lattice, we'll choose the direction of E and A just to be uh, along the direction, or perpendicular to the direction of the, of the edge. So it's, um, on each edge, there's a fixed direction. But this is a quantum mechanical degree of freedom, and E and A don't commute. And if you look at the commutation relation, it's mm, pretty much like uh, a rotor degrees of freedom or harmonic oscillator where conjugate variables uh, have, have commutation relation like that. This is just what quantum mechanics do. Uh, in quantum mechanics, E and A are not mutually independent variables. They have non-trivial commutation relation, meaning that they cannot be measured exactly at the same time. And in particular, This E field, once we put it on the lattice, then we can, we can see what is the variable for E. It turns out that E is an integer variable, and A is a phase factor. So E is an integer variable taking value from 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2, and all the way up. And A is a phase factor taking value between 0 and 2 pi. And, and it, it makes sense why E is an integer variable because, well, because of this relation. This is the so-called Gauss's law uh, in Maxwell's equation. It is saying that if you integrate the, electro the electric field flux through a surface, it tells you how much charge is inside. Right? So on a lattice, what we do is that we integrate the electric field on these four edges, one, two, three, four. We add them up together, and we should get how much charge there is at this particular lattice site. But charge is quantized know that charge is quantized, and if charge is quantized, we better have all the, the E field to be integer, otherwise we wouldn't always get uh, integer charge within a surface. So charge quantization tells us that 
uh, e is integer. And quantum mechanically, we know that if, if we have a variable where uh, one set of <coughs> operator has integer eigenvalue, then the conjugate one better be a phase factor taking value from zero to two pi. Yes. Sorry? Oh, half integer. Uh, yes, if it's half integer, then half integer is pretty much integer <laughs> with one half in front. So you just uh, rescale everything and uh, yes. Uh, maybe the phase factor go from zero to four pi and then you have half integer. Right. Um, uh, okay, so, uh, so, so, so the electromagnetic field in quantum mechanics is described by a, a pretty much rotor degrees of freedom, right? It, it's uh, characterized by two sets of variables. One is integer and the other is a phase factor. Okay. And now we can see uh, how the symmetry transformation on the gauge field can actually be generated. Well, we know what, we, uh, what the gauge transformation does. The gauge transformation takes A and send it to A plus gradient F. And then, uh, and of course, the, the C field, C dagger goes to E to the I F uh, C dagger. And if we want to change A, now we have a way to do it in a, with a unitary operation because A and E has non-trivial commutation. So if we make an, uh, a unitary operator by doing like something like E to the I something, uh, like a, 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 what's a good notation, like beta uh, E, and use it to conjugate A. And because A and E doesn't commute, this is actually going to generate some transformation on A. So, so this commutation re relation allow us to write this transformation on the A field together with this transformation on the matter field in the following form. So it becomes E to the I F gradient E minus rho, where rho is the charge density, the, uh, the, the, the number of charge on lattice side, or it's the, the charge operator at the lattice side, which is uh, just uh, C dagger C, which is just C dagger C. Yes. Okay. So this is now looking more and more like what we have over there. So it has two parts. One, it involves e to the i f rho, which involves the symmetry charge per lattice site. And the second part is e to the i gradient f, uh, e to the i f gradient e. And actually we can exchange the gradient and move the gradient to, to f so it becomes e to the i gradient f e. It should be just gradient f e. I, sorry, I, I think I'm, I may have made some mistakes here. It should just be a gradient f e. So let me write it. This is gradient F E, and there's um, uh, F rho here. Yes. 
Yes. Oh, which line? One, two, three, four. Yeah, right. Oh, here. Right. So, so. What is this? What is this one? Oh, yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. So you just uh, you you can use this to conjugate the a and c variables. So let's say this is the unitary operator at a particular vertex, and you use this operator to conjugate the a, and you see that a will shift like that, just because E and A has, has this commutation relation. And also, it takes a little bit algebra. So, and also, if you use it to uh, conjugate the, the C operator, C dagger operator, it also transforms in, in the way that you want. Okay. Right, so it decomposes into two parts. One is the, uh, a rotation generated by the symmetry charge on each lattice side, and the other is um, the rotation of the gauge field generated by the, the E field, generated by the electric field on the vector potential part of the gauge field. Okay. okay. Uh, yes. Sorry? Uh, so you use the uh, expression T. Yes. Oh. Yes. This is a unitary that I want to apply uh, in order to generate these two transformations. And apply it in the way that I conjugate a variable. Uh, like in quantum mechanics, that's how we do transformation operators. Okay, and, um, and by restricting to the lattice, uh, I can just choose f to be a delta function, delta at a particular location, such that this is just rotation on a particular lattice site, and this one only involves the E field on the edges that goes out from this particular point. Right. Everywhere else, the transformation will be trivial. It's only at the site and also on the edges. So it's almost looking like what we have over there. And then the final step in order to make the connection is to realize that this is a U1 gauge field, and we have a Z2 gauge field over here. And when we go, go from a U1 gauge field to a Z2 gauge field, a lot of things can change. For example, the charge is not labeled by integer anymore. It's only labeled by even and odd, or 0 and 1. So the E field also takes value in 0 and 1. Okay, and that actually corresponds to the tau z operator if we take the exponential of e. Right. So tau z is the exponential of e and takes value in plus minus one, as we would want for a poly operator. On the other hand, the A field also needs to get a Z2 character to it. And the way we, we do a, we, we reduce the, the A field from um, a U1 to Z2 is by defining this tau x operator as e to the i integration of A along this edge, and we require this integration to be either 0 or pi. Okay, 
So, so it, it has to be either one of the value, and again, tau x contains value of plus minus one, which is exactly what we want for a poly operator. And what's nice about this is that you can check that tau x and tau z defined in this way, they anti-commute with each other, which is exactly, uh, they anti-commute due to the, the commutation relation that we have over there between the E field and the A field, and anti-commutation relation is exactly what we want for the Z2 gauge field right, in Tauric code. And now you can see that this UV operator, if we choose the F to be a delta function at a particular spatial location, it just reduced to uh, what we had over there because at the lattice side, what we do is uh, we take e to the i um, pi, uh, the, the charge on the lattice side. Here it has to be pi because, uh, because it's a Z2 uh, charge and we can have the charge to be either zero or one. So this is uh, uh, the, uh, the, the sigma z part, which is e to the i pi rho, right? And then the tau z part is just this. Tau z part is this, and this is just that one. If we set f to be pi delta x at this particular point, and then zero everywhere else. So, tau z is equal to e to the i pi. Okay. So see that when I, when I define Tori code, when I, when I say, okay, this is the local symmetry I want, I didn't just create something um, totally crazy, and this, this comes from the, comes from electromagnetism, it comes especially from the quantum version of electromagnetism and how uh, the gauge field would couple to the matter field. And on a lattice with discrete gauge group, this is exactly how it should work. Okay. Um, Okay. Yes. Oh, when, when they're on the same edge, they don't yeah. commute. Yeah, so okay. for the same degree of freedom, mm -hmm. they don't commute, right? So basically, we're introducing some bosonic degree of freedom, some rotor degree of freedom to describe the gauge field. Of course, again, a fundamental difference between what's going on with Maxwell's equation or the standard model is that the gauge symmetry is something inherent. It's something that's just what it, what it is. It has to be like that. But from Tauric code, or from what we're doing here, we see that the gauge symmetry is something emergent. Okay. Something that comes with the topological order. It's something that we, we can impose, but we don't have to be literally serious about it. <laughs> we can relax a little bit, but then, as long as we just perturb it a little bit, it always emerges uh, at long distance as a global property uh, of the topological phase. Okay, so I have a little bit of time, so maybe I can well, talk a little bit about uh, this one, where we have fermions hopping on a lattice, and then we want to couple it to a gauge field. This is probably the uh, the, the, the most uh, 
um, 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 familiar case where you would encounter coupling a matter field to a gauge field, this is something people talk about all the time that we have, um, because this is real, right? You can literally have um, you know, material where electrons hop uh, between uh, the lattice side, and then we have real electromagnetic field that couples uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the fermions hopping there. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about how to do this coupling following exactly the same procedure uh, that we showed, which worked for the transverse field icing model. Okay, we have again two dimensional lattice. And we have fermions hopping. So on each lattice side, we have C dagger C, and we can create or annihilate fermions. And the fermions can hop, meaning that we have some term C dagger C plus C C dagger uh, uh, between each bound. Okay. And, um, and, and then how do we couple it to gauge field? Okay. We're coupling it to gauge field, meaning that uh, we want to put some vector potential along each edge. Okay. So there are actually different situations that people talk about. In the simplest case, in uh, actually a common discussion is where we don't consider the gauge field as quantum mechanical gauge field. Okay. We just consider some classical gauge field and that's totally legitimate, especially in common condensed matter setting where the, we just add some Electro, electric field or magnetic field to our system, and we don't consider the quantum dynamics associated with that. Right? We just consider that uh, the field is there, we add it by hand, it's so strong that it, its dynamics is not going to be affected by the electron in the system. Okay. So if we take that limit, if we think that the, 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 the electromagnetic field just exists in the background and we don't need to consider the, the back and forth uh, um, 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 inter, in, interaction, be, not, not interaction, we don't consider the back action on the electromagnetic field by the matter field in the system, then we just treat the, the electromagnetic field as something fixed, which means we fix the A into certain pattern, uh, or we fix the, the, the flux within uh, each plaquette to be certain value. And then the electron will hop according to that. And the way uh, this A field will change the hopping is by changing C dagger C to C dagger E to the I A C. Right. Exactly the same as we would do the coupling for the icing one. So for the icing one, we we, we put in between a tau z term, where is it? Here, oh, sorry, we're putting in between a tau x term. And this tau x term is exactly the exponential of the A field, of course, integrated along the, along the edge. And that contributes an extra phase factor uh, uh, to your hopping. Okay. And if you have non-trivial flux pattern, then this, this, this change of phase factor is something that's actually going to change your dynamics. So this is one. This is just treating the electromagnetic field as the background. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you might consider a situation where the, the electromagnetic field is actually dynamical. It's quantum mechanical. So we actually need to think about them as a quantum mechanical degrees of freedom whose dynamics might be affected um, by the matter field in the system. Right. And in that case, we literally need to consider them as a set of conjugate variables by E and A, and we need to do something like this. Okay. We need to take the hopping term, imagine that this is the hopping term. We take the hopping term, modify it such that it's gauge symmetric. At the flux term, the flux term is just saying that I integrate A around the full circle, 
or I can do the, the, the unitary version of it. I can integrate A and take the ex exponential of it and multiply over the whole circle. That should give me identity. And then I also have gauge symmetry. I put that together and I have a full quantum mechanical description of quantum mechanical matter field coupled to quantum mechanical electromagnetic field. Okay, so one final thing. If we have a superconductor, we don't have just an insulator. If we have a, a not an insulator or metal, if we have a superconductor, which involves terms like delta C dagger, C dagger, plus delta star, CC. Right? So this is the kind of term you will see in a BCS, way, uh, BCS Hamiltonian, where you have um, a mean field, um, Cooper pair terms for Cooper, uh, Cooper pair creation and annihilation. If we have these kind of terms, these kind of terms, they break the U1 symmetry. If you're still trying to do this kind of symmetry transformation, that kind of term is not symmetric anymore unless, unless this alpha is equal to pi. So the U1 symmetry gets reduced to a Z2 symmetry from in, when we go from a metal to a superconductor, something I mentioned just now. So that when, when we have a superconductor Hamiltonian, we cannot couple to the usual electromagnetic field. We need to couple to uh, the, the Z2 gauge field, like for the icing model. Okay. And so now in this case, we don't have E and A as the gauge field. Instead, we have tau x and tau z as the gauge field. But we can still couple them to that tau x and tau z gauge field. Okay. So the thing we need to do is to insert between here a tau x and insert between here a tau x. Okay. And we do the same procedure. We take the Hamiltonian, modify the Hamiltonian, add the flux term, add the gauge constraint. And then you can ask, what is that phase? Different superconductor actually give rise to different gauge theory. There's still Z2 gauge theory, but with fermionic charge this time, right? because we know that the charge of electrons, or at least a uh, group of quasi particles, so, so they are fermionic. And they should have pi statistics with the flux, but other than that, how the flux should respond, how the flux should behave, what kind of statistic does the flux have is, a, is related to what kind of superconductor we started from. Okay. And if you're interested in this, this is uh, the, uh, what Kitai wrote about the 16-fold way uh, in his big paper, uh, Anyang's in exactly solvable models and beyond, and that huge 130-page paper. Um, yeah, so I won't go into that. Uh, if you're interested, you can read it. And uh, so this is um, for today. And tomorrow, I plan to talk about how to gauge a symmetry-protected topological phase. Uh, again, with Z2 symmetry. So here, uh, we had a spin model with global Z2 symmetry, but it's a pretty trivial one where everywhere the spin is just polarized. But tomorrow, we're going to talk about a non-trivial um, symmetric phase under Z2 symmetry and how gauging it can give rise to a different topological order, a different Z2 gauge theory than toric code. And finally, I want to go a little bit beyond, talk about how to gauge system with subsystem symmetry, something called subsystem symmetry into something that people recently got very interested in called fractal order. Okay, so these are pretty new stuff, but, but they're actually very simple in terms of uh, exactly solve model and the algebra. So that's something I hope to cover tomorrow.